ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد الحمد لله الحمد لله this is our first class returning from the Ramadan break. We had finished the 27th juz. This class, insha'Allah, upon return in the latter part of the month of Shawwal, 1437, we are in the 28th juz. Juz qad Allah. And this is the 55th Hizb. All right. As we know, there are 60 Hizb and there are 30 Juz. So we are in the 55th Hizb. The Hizb is Hizb Qadasami Allah. Juz Qadasami Allah. So the 55th and 56th Hizb are in the 28th Juz. And the first Surah in this Juz is Surah Mujadila. So we're going to look at this surah and however far Allah brings us here. So in Zal al-Musir for Ilm tafsir Imam Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah, he says, quote, We now take a look at Surah Al-Mujadila. This is a surah that is from al Madina." based upon the statement of Ibn Abbas Al-Hasan Al-Basri Mujahid and Ikrimah that's the understanding of the vast majority however it should also be understood from Ata that there are some ayat in this surah that are from Mecca. The same was said by Ibn Sa'ib. And some ayat that are Meccan would include Surah Mujadila, the 58th surah, ayah 7. The Exalted One, he gives the heading on this surah as Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Qad sami'allahu qawla allati tujadiluka fi zawjiha wa tashtaki ila Allah Wallahu yasma'u tuhawurakuma Inna allaha sami'un basir Al-lazina yudahiruna minkum min nisa'ihim Ma hunna ummahatihim in ummahatuhum illa allahi waladanahum wa innahum liyakuluna munkaram min alqawli wa zura wa inna allaha la'afuun ghafur وَالَّذِينَ يُظَاهِرُونَ مِن نِسَائِهِمْ ثُمَّ يَعُودُونَ لِمَا قَالُوا لِمَا قَالُوا فَتَحْرِيرُ رَقَبَةٍ مِّن قَبْلِ أَن يَتَمَاسَّا ذَلِكُمْ تُوعَظُونَ بِهِ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرٌ 
فمن لم يجد في صيام شهرين متتابعين من قبل أن يتماسا فمن لم يستطع فإطعام ستين مسكينا ذلك لتؤمنوا بالله ورسوله وتلك حدود الله وللكافرين عذاب أليم إن الذين يحادون الله ورسوله كبتوا كما كبت الذين من قبلهم وقد أنزلنا آيات بينات وللكافرين عذاب مهين يوم يبعثهم الله جميعا فينبئهم بما كانوا بما عملوا أحصاه الله ونسوه والله على كل شيء شهيد. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. Allah has heard the words of the one who disputed with you regarding her husband. And she complained to Allah. And Allah heard your discussion. Indeed, Allah is all hearing, all seeing. Those who they proclaim idhar of their wives from among you and declare them as, as if they are their mothers, their wives are not their mothers. Their mothers are only those who gave birth to them. And indeed, they have said a wrong statement and an open and clear false witness. Indeed, Allah after this is pardoning and forgiving. Those who declare idhar from their wives, then they, they go back on what they had said, are to free one slave before they approach their wives again. That is an admonition for them to take heed of and for you. And Allah is all informed of that which you do. Whoever did not find a slave to free, then let him fast two months concurrently before he approaches his wife. Whoever is not able to do this, then let him feed 60 needy people. That is so that you might believe in Allah and his messenger. Those are the boundaries of Allah. And the unbelievers have a stern penalty coming to them. Those who oppose Allah and his messenger shall be destroyed just as those before them were destroyed. And we sent down clear and clear and decisive signs. The unbelievers possess a tremendous punishment that is coming. On a day in which Allah so resurrect them all and inform, and inform them of that which they used to do. Allah has preserved and recorded the matter, but they forgot all about it. And Allah is witness over everything. Surah Al-Mujadila, the 58th Surah, Ayat 1 to 6. <clears throat> when Allah the Exalted has mentioned, and Allah has heard the words of the one who disputed with you regarding her husband, the reason for revelation of this ayah, we have a narration from Aisha radiallahu anha that she mentioned, Blessed be Allah, the one who hears all voices. A disputing woman came and spoke to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and I was near the side of the house and I could hear her words, but some of it I could not hear. She was complaining about her husband and said, Messenger of Allah, I have been put to trial by my husband. And my age is senior, and I'm elder, I'm elderly, and I'm no longer giving birth, 
Yet my husband has declared Ivhar from me. O oh Allah, I complain to you about this. Aisha goes on to say, This carried on until the angel Jibreel alayhi salam came with these ayat. As far as the statement, the commentary of this, when Allah the Exalted has said, Already Allah has heard. As the judge has said, this expression, قَدْ سَمِعَ Allah. This expression is indicating the clarity of the matter. In addition to this, some have said that it is permissible to say قَدْ سَمِعَ Allah. Because they're because Qad the Dal and the Seen are both coming from the close to the same place on the tongue. So some have said, Qad Sami Allah, Qad Sami Allah. However, reciting Qad Sami Allah is also permitted. Because even if they are close together, the letters Seen and Dal are coming from slightly different places of articulation. The dal, the ta, and the ta are close together. But these three letters are coming from a place that is close. Whereas the seen and zay and sod are also coming from one place that's very close together. The letters of seen, zay, and sod are called the whistling letters because they imitate things that one finds in nature. <clears throat> now the name of this surah, Surah Mujadila, has to do with the woman that came disputing regarding her husband. It is said that the name of the woman was Khawla bint Thalaba. This was said by Mujahid ibn Abbas as well as Ikrima and Qatada ibn Daima and Al Qurdi. Now, although it's been said that this woman's name was Khawla bin Thalaba, another group have said that her name was Khawla, but she is Khawla bint Khuwaylid. This was mentioned by Ikrima from Ibn Abbas. A third group has said that her name was Khawla bint as Samit, as mentioned by Ibn Abbas. While the fourth group has said her name is Khawla bint at Dalij or Dulaj. This was said by Abu Aliya. Now, as for her husband, his name was Aus ibn as Samit, and they were both from the Ansar. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said <clears throat> this ayah refers to <clears throat> this ayah refers to the point in history in which a man used to say to his wife in the age of ignorance you are to me like the back of my mother and when this was said this would mean that she was forbidden for him for sexual contact. The first one who ever made Idhar, which is what this is referred to, in Islam was Aus ibn as -Samit. Then he felt remorse for what he did and he said to his wife, go to the Messenger of Allah and ask him regarding this matter. So she came to him and this ayah was these ayat were revealed. As far as the disputation that occurred with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said to her well you have been declared for him as unpermitted she said 
but by Allah he did not mention talaq. So what is this about? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Nothing's been revealed to me about this matter yet. I am waiting. So she complained to Allah for assistance and for an answer to this question. And she said, O oh Allah, I complain to you of my condition. And this word, teshteki, is the same expression. Teshteki has the same meaning as teshku, ishtekate, shakwata, which means, or shakwa, or shikwa, or shukwa, which all of these mean complaint. Poetry wise, there was a statement that was made. If he knew what the complaint was about, would he have complained? And indeed, if he had known the speech that was being spoken, would he have still complained? The word shteka is being used here. Now, when the exalted one says, those who do ivhar from among you, from their wives, alladhina yuzahiruna minkum min nisa'ihim, Ibn Kathir, Nafi' and Abu Amr recite this as Alladhina yudhahiruna But Abu, Abu, Abu Jafar, Ibn Amr, Hamza and Al-Kasai recite it as Alladhina yudhahiruna Well some say Yadhaharuna. Awesome recites it as Yudhahiruna. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu recited it as Yatadhaharuna. Wa Ubay ibn Ka'ab recited it as Yatadhaharuna. Now, the recitation of Al Hassan al Basri, Qatada, and Al Dahak is Yudhiruna or Yadhiruna. Now, the meaning is <coughs> that when you say, You ladies are to me like the backs of our mothers, Allah responds by saying, But they are not their mothers. Meaning, they are not the women that gave birth to you. Because what you have done is, by saying you are to me as my mother's back, you have, in a sense, tried to declare these women as forbidden for you. But your mothers are not them. Your mothers are only those who gave birth to you. So this expression is declaring here, that your mothers are only those who gave birth to you and they can't be given any other category. Now those who have made ivhar say a word that is wrong because they have likened their wives to their mothers and their mothers are forbidden to them for sexual contact in perpetuity, which this is not the case for their wives. And it is a lie to call the wives, the mothers. Indeed, Allah is pardoning and forgiving. Pardoning and forgiving because the way to attain the pardon and forgiveness after committing this calamity is to carry through the expiation. Those who make ifhar from their wives, then they go back on what they say. So meaning they go back and declare their wives permitted from them after they had made them impermissible for themselves regarding sexual intercourse. So when they go back to this, an expiation must be, must be made. So the meaning of the ayah symbolizes they return from that which they had said before. And they nullify or rebuke that which they had said before. Sa'id ibn Jubair. Radiallahu anhu said, 
This ayah means that when they seek to return to having sexual intercourse after they had previously declared their wives impermissible for themselves. And the same thing was said by Hassan al-Basri and Tawus and al-Zuhri. So the, the Aud, the return here, those who return from what they say, the return refers to sexual intercourse. This goes back to what we had said. Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, said, the return means after they take hold of them again, after doing idhar, or after doing dhihar, because this principle is called dhihar or idhar, after they've done dhihar for a period of time where it's possible where they might divorce them or not divorce them. When they find this is the case and they've taken back the wife, then an expiation is due. <laughs> because the intent of Lihar is declaring her impermissible for himself. Now, if that reaches to Talaq, then we've already discussed what is to do with Talaq. But if he remains silent regarding Talaq and he regrets what he has done, then he returns to what he was upon before. And in that case... If he has decided not to declare the talaq, then at that point he must give the expiation. It has also been said that the that the lihar the lihar is a declaration in which one has two options because. When he has done this, he is either headed towards declaring talaq or not. The same was said by az zajaj and Abu Ali al-Farisi. I said the same thing. Now the expression he returns to means he's going to what he had been upon before. However, to return can also mean he's going to something that he had not been upon before. Because the Akhirah is, is referred to as Mi'ad, and no one has gone to it before. So it can mean those who return to what they had said, meaning those who had not gone to it, it bears a double meaning. And to Allah, return all matters. Surah Al-Baqarah, the second Surah 210, which we've already discussed. Now, Ibn Qutaybah has said, whoever it appears to him that the lihar does not occur unless someone says those words, then it's nothing. Because it needs to be understood that, that the people sometimes understand that the lihar can occur if someone intended it. But the, the lihar occurs with one statement. And this is the interpretation of the ayah. The people of the age of ignorance used to sometimes make talaq by lihar. But Allah the exalted made the judgment of lihar in Islam the opposite of what the judgment was in jahiliyyah. I.e. that it was not divorce. And he sent down the ayah by saying, those who they declare lihar from their wives, meaning in the age of ignorance, then they return to what they had said before, meaning in Islam. They return to what they had been saying before this statement. They owe an expiation. So they must free one slave. The scholars of commentary all say, so they must do this. This is the expiation. The freeing of the slave. The, the question asked is, is it a condition that the slave freed must be a believer? Imam Ahmed has two rulings in this regard. They must free one slave before they approach their wives. 
This is an elu- this is an allusion to sexual intercourse. On that the scholars now they differ. In this event, then, is it permitted for the one that has declared lihar to touch and pleasure his wife by his hands or to kiss her, but refraining from sexual intercourse until the expiation has been paid? Imam Ahmed has two rulings in this regard. Abu al-Hasan al-Akhfash has said, this ayah, those who make lihar from their wives, then let them free a slave. This then intends that when they do that, they can return to their wives after having made the expiation. I'd like to say briefly, when the one that has declared lihar from his wife has sexual intercourse before he's paid the expiation, this is sinful. And this requires the expiation still because it has not been paid yet. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah has said, in this instance, if he has had sexual intercourse with his wife before the expiation has been paid, that the lihar as well as the expiation have fallen from him. The scholars differ with regards to what has been made compulsory for him when that has been done. Al-Hasan al-Basri, Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, Tawus, Mujahid, Ibrahim, and Ibn Sirin all say, when he does this, he owes one expiation. But as Zuhri, Qatada, and others say no, he owes two. Because he had sexual intercourse with her before the expiation was paid, which was a sinful act. Now if he said, you are to me like my mother's back today, then the lihar is nullified by the passing of the day. And this is the statement of our scholars, but also the statement of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, and al-Shafi'i, rahimahumullah. Ibn Abi Layla, Malik, Ibn Anas, and al-Hasan ibn Salih, rahimahumullah kulluhum, say that if he says that, you are to me like my mother's back today, that means that the, the one he's declared this to is in a permanent state of lihar. Now, then the question comes that the scholars have also differed in regarding lihar of the slave girl that has then been married. Ibn Abbas, who has said, the slave girl that has been taken on in marriage does not have lihar. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib has said the same thing as well as the Sha'bi and Ibrahim al nakhai Abu Hanifa, al Shafi'i. But Sa'id ibn Jubair and Tawus and Ata, Al-Awza'i, Sufyan al-Thawri and Malik, all of these Imams rahimahumullah say, no, there is the horror in this case. Abu Talib has narrated from Imam Ahmed that he said, no, there's no lihar in this case. But he still has to give the expiation for what he's done. Just as in the case of when it happened and was mentioned in the ayah. But it is not, the person does not go into lihar. But you must give the expiation for it. Now they've differed in a number of areas, the scholars as well. And how many times this might happen? Imams Abu Hanifa and Shafi'i rahimahullah say, if the lihar happened on a number of occasions where it was declared, then the expiations also must be a number of them. But if it was in one gathering, then the expiation is one. 
Al-Qadim Ya'la al-Baghdadi rahimahullah, the elder, has said, No, he must only give one expiation, whether it was in one gathering or in several. This is also the statement of Imam Malik. That is an, when, then when Allah says that is an admonition for you to take heed of. Meaning, as the judge has said, a warning. Because to have to give an expiation for something is a severe matter. And this, the purpose of the expiation being done is so that you might leave the practice of doing the har. So whoever does not find the slave to free, Allah says, let him fast two months concurrently, meaning without stoppage, before he might touch his wife again. And whoever is not able, meaning to do the fast, then his expiation is to feed 60 needy ones. So this is a far thing that must be done according to what we mentioned. And this is so that you might believe in Allah and his messenger, meaning so that you might truthfully accept that Allah has ordered with this and bear witness of the fact that his messenger brought it. And these are the boundaries of Allah. Meaning, these are the expiations that Allah has declared for the case of Lihar. And there are no other expiations besides this. And for the unbelievers is a stern penalty. Ibn Abbas has said, this warning is for whoever might deny this ayah or reject the expiations that have been put. Those who oppose Allah and the Messenger. Now we've already mentioned the meaning of opposition, this word, in Surah the Tawbah, the ninth Surah, Ayah 63. And regarding the expression, those will be destroyed. We've mentioned the meaning of this word, kubitu, as well as muhad, in Surah Ali Imran, the third Surah, 127. Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, said, those who were destroyed, they were destroyed on the day of the battle of the trench. Because they were destined to be pushed back. And those before them that had denied the truth were those who had fought against their messengers. And when Allah says, a day in which he, Allah, shall resurrect all of them, meaning from their graves, and inform them of what they used to do regarding their disobedience and their leaving of his obligations. He, Allah, has preserved this for them. Although they forgot. <coughs> and Allah is witness over everything, meaning regarding their deeds of the evil and the good, what they did in secret and openly. Then Allah the Exalted he says, Alam Tara and Allah Lamuma Fisamawati Wama Fil Aru. ما يكون من نجوى ثلاثة إلا هو رابعهم ولا خمسة إلا هو سادسهم إلا هو سادسهم ولا أدنى من ذلك ولا أكثر إلا هو معهم أينما كانوا ثم ينبئهم بما عملوا يوم القيامة إن الله بكل شيء عليم <تصفيق> ألم تر إلى الذين نهوا عن النجوى ثم يعودون لما نهوا عنه لما نهوا عنه ويتناجون بالإثم والعدوان ومعصية الرسول وإذا جاءك 
وَإِذَا جَاءُوكَ حَيَّوْكَ بِمَا لَمْ يُحَيِّكَ بِهِ اللَّهُ وَيَقُولُونَ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ لَوْ لَا يُعَذِّبُنَا اللَّهُ بِمَا نَقُولُ <تصفيق> حسبهم جهنم يصلونها فبئس المصير يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا تناجيتم فلا تناجوا بالإثم والعدوان ومعصية الرسول ومعصية الرسول وتناجوا بالبر والتقوى واتقوا الله الذي إليه تحشرون إنما النجوى من الشيطان ليحزن الذين آمنوا ليحزن الذين آمنوا وليس بضارهم شيئا إلا بإذن الله وعلى الله فليتوكل المؤمنون يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا قيل لكم تفسحوا في المجالس فافسحوا يفسح الله لكم وإذا قيل انشزوا فانشزوا يرفع الله الذين آمنوا يرفع الله الذين آمنوا منكم والذين أوتوا العلم درجات والله بما تعملون خبير <coughs> Have you not seen and have you not come to know that indeed Allah knows what's in the skies and the earth there is no gathering of three except he's the fourth of them, nor gathering of five except that he is the sixth of them, nor less than that nor more than that except that he is with them wherever they are. Then he shall inform them of that which they used to do on the day of resurrection. Indeed, Allah knows everything. Have you not looked to those who they were forbidden from being in secret council? Then they return to the secret council after having been forbidden from doing so. And they hold secret counsel in sin, enmity, disobedience to the messenger. And when they come to you, they greet you in ways in which no one should be greeted. And they say in themselves after this, well, why doesn't Allah punish us on account of what we say? Their home and reckoning is the great fire in which they shall be scorched therein. Evil is that which they used to do. You who believe... When you hold counsel, do not hold counsel in sin, enmity, and disobedience to the messenger, but hold counsel in righteousness and in piety, and fear Allah who you shall be returned to. Indeed, secret counsels are from the shaitan, so that he might cause mournfulness in the believers. But he shall not harm them at all, unless by the permission of Allah. And upon Allah, let the believers put their trust. You who believe, when it is said to you, spread out in the gathering and make room, make room, and Allah shall make room for you. And when it is said, spread out, then spread out. Allah certainly raises those who believe from among you. And those who were given knowledge are raised in ranks. And Allah is all informed of that which you do. Surah Al-Mujadid of the 58th Surah, Ayat 7 to 11. And when the Exalted One has said regarding this matter, there is no gathering of three. مَا يَكُونُ مِنَّ جَوَى ثَلَاثَ Abu Jafar recites this as مَا تَكُونُ <coughs> Ibn Qutayba says that Najwa here means a secret council. As the judge has said, so there's no three that are gathered together in a secret council and communing. 
except that he is the fourth of them. This means that meaning that he knows about it. Abdahak has said, when Allah has said, and he, Allah, is with them wherever they are, meaning his knowledge that he knows about them. Have you not seen those who were forbidden from secret counsel? There are two incidents that led to this ayah being revealed. One was the Jews and the hypocrites, because they used to hold secret councils in which what was going on between the believers was discussed. And they looked at the believers and what they were doing. And they used to wink at one another when they saw the believers. And they would hold secret counsel saying, we don't see them except that there comes to them some information from our near relatives and our brothers who they left and went out. Whether they get killed or they die or they suffer some difficulty. And this difficulty, whenever it would happen and they'd speak about the believers and held these secret councils, the believers used to feel saddened. And this carried on <clears throat> for, for a period of time. And the believers came complaining to the Messenger of Allah about being spoken about in secret councils. And the fact that even when they spoke to them about doing this, they carried on doing it. This ayah was sent down in response to this. This was mentioned by Ibn Abbas. <laughs> Secondly, is the Jews in question is mentioned by Mujahid and Muqatil <clears throat> that when there used to be agreement and cooperation between the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and the Jews, there was still tension because when a man from the Muslims was alone by himself, they used to gather together some of the Jews and talk about him. And the Muslim used to say, oh no. Are they gathering together in secret council about how to kill me? Or do they hate me? So he would leave the roadside out of fear. And this came to the attention of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, So he forbade them from having these secret councils. But the children of Israel did not refrain from this and return to doing it again. And this ayah was sent down. Ibn Asa'ib says, that the hypocrites were a part of this in the secret councils or gatherings and when they were forbidden to have these secret gatherings to plot and plan they would return to these gatherings now the ayah they would hold the secret gatherings Hamza and Yaqub recited as but the rest say and these secret gatherings are held in sin and enmity so they're looking to find out bad things about the Muslims and the sin and the enmity and they're advising one another on how to disobey the messenger وسلم, and they're doing this after he told them not to and this is what is meant by the sin the enmity and disobeying of the messenger and when they came to you they greet you now this ayah was sent down regarding some of the children of Israel and this is because Aisha radiallahu said that some people from the children of Israel one day came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, As-Samu alaykum, may poison be upon you, Abu Qasim. So I said, As-Samu alaykum wa fa'alallahu bikum. And may the poison and wrath of Allah be upon all of you together. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Aisha, don't do this, for indeed Allah does not love the cursing and vulgarity. I said, Messenger of Allah, didn't you hear what they said? And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded, Do you not see that I returned to them that which they said? And I only said to them in response, Wa alaykum, I returned to them what they gave me. So this ayah was sent down regarding this matter. As Zajaj has said, Sam in this instance means poison, but more particularly it refers to death. So they would speed up the expression As-Salamu Alaikum by saying As-Salamu Alaikum with quickness. The hypocrites would sometimes adopt the same thing. So when they would greet you, meaning 
the scholars of commentary all say, they would greet you without salam, without saying assalamu alaikum. They would stay instead, salam alaikum. And when they left out, they would say among themselves, well, why isn't, if he was a prophet, Allah would punish us on account of what we said. <clears throat> but Allah the Exalted has said in response to this, to the believers, you who believe, when you hold counsel, meaning those who believe when they hold counsel, don't do it how the hypocrites and the Jewish people did it, when you hold counsel in a gathering, do so with righteousness, in obedience to Allah, piety, leaving disobedience. So the righteousness, hold the counsels, whatever counsels that you have, in righteousness and in piety so that you leave lying. Don't do what the Jews and the hypocrites did because that's from shaitan. Because secret counsels are from the shaitan. And so that shaitan might use these secret counsels to sadden and put harm on the believers. But he cannot harm them. Meaning shaitan cannot harm the believers at all except by the permission of Allah. Meaning if he Allah has willed it from before. And upon Allah let the believers put their trust. Meaning let them return all their affairs to Allah. You who believe when it's said to you, make room in the gatherings. Now this, إِذَا قِيلَ لَكُمْ تَفَسَّحُوا فِي الْمَجْلِسِ Whereas Asim recites it, فِي الْمَجَالِسِ In the plural. Because every seated one has a gathering place. So the meaning is, let every man from among you spread out in the gathering and make room for others. The scholars of commentary all say that this ayah was sent down regarding a group of believers that used to go quickly to the gathering of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and when the immigrants came and the people of high rank they didn't used to be able to find a place because all the places had been taken to sit down. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, wanted to have the people of goodness close to him and near him. So, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, on a Friday would be seated in a location in the masjid. And a group of the people of Badr would come. And among them was Thabit ibn Qais ibn, Shim, ibn Shimas. And they would give the greeting and would wait until the time came for them to move forward. And they would gather together. And others would come forward. But often this would leave places taken up so others could not come and this was very difficult for the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam for he did not know what to do because sometimes someone would say oh you there stand up and get out of the way and then some of them would stand up and they were not able they were not able to find their place or someone would stand up and then his place would be taken while he was standing so he couldn't sit down again so he could see all of this the people in the gathering, their faces were saddened and they disliked this. The hypocrites spoke about that. And they said, oh, by Allah, there's no good in this. So this ayah was sent down. Qatada said that the companions used to race with one another and compete to see who would get the closest space to the Messenger of Allah وسلم. And what happened is the gathering would become constricted. So Allah told them to make space for one another. To spread out the gathering. And so when they're sitting, don't allow it to become tightened, but spread out and make space so that people can find a place to sit. So that the people can be in the gathering. Now, this shows the virtue of being close to the Messenger of Allah. And it also shows the rank of the people of Badr because he often kept them close to him. Now, the Majlis here is referring to three things when you have a majlis. Number one, the war gathering. When you are preparing your gathering, make sure that you have your warriors, your chiefs, and your captains around you. 
so that they might know who is to be the attacker, who is to be the defender, who is to go forward. This is the statement of Ibn Abbas al-Hassan al-Basri, Abu al-Aliyah al-Qurdi. The second is, this refers to the gathering of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those that might gather around him to take knowledge. This is said by Mujahid and Qatada. So when you take knowledge, you make room in the gathering. And number three, gatherings of dhikr. Gatherings of dhikr. This was mentioned by Qatada and others. Tafassahu fil majalis. And this is how the ayah was recited by Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abu Rizin, Abu Abdul Rahman, Mujahid, Al Hassan al Basri, Ikrima, Qatada ibn Daima, and Ibn Abi Abla, and Al A'mash. Make room in the gathering and Allah will make room for you. Meaning that Allah will make room for you in the paradise and the gatherings therein. And when it is said to them, now spread out. Nafia ibn Amr, Hafs from Asim, have this. وَإِذَا قِيلَ شُزُوا Spread out. فَانْشُزُوا Ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, Hamza al Kasai say, An Shizu. This means spread out when you're told, when you are in the gatherings, spread out in the gatherings and make room. And when it is said, set out or spread out, in this sense it means stand up. So when you stand for prayer, When you're called for the prayer, stand up in preparation for this. And stand to fight the enemies in preparation in rows. And stand for any good thing. Stand for enjoying the right and forbidding the wrong. And when you're told, spread out, meaning to stand up and leave from the house of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Because when they would sit in his house for a long period of time, and when it was time when it was time to go, they would spread they would stand up and spread out to leave. All of this was mentioned by Ikrima al Dahak Al Hasan al Basri Mujahid Ibn Zaid. So when you stand and you move and you go out to your brothers, as said by Tha'alabi, Allah raises those who believe from among you. Meaning, those who have Iman, He raises over whoever does not have Iman. And those who were given knowledge, He raises above those who have not been given knowledge. So He raises those who are alim above those who are not alim. The question then comes, is this being raised in rank, is this in the earthly life or in the hereafter? There are two statements on this matter. The raising of the ranks being referred to is the raising of the ranks in the paradise. But it's also their gatherings are raised in the earthly life as well. So it's according to their virtues in the deen and their knowledge. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu has said, O people, understand this ayah very well so that you might strive in knowledge. For indeed Allah raises the believer that is an alim above the one who is not an alim by several levels.
<clears throat> then the exalted one he says, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu idha najaytumu rasoola faqaddimu bayna yadayna jawakum sadaqah thalika khayrun lakum wa atahar fa in lam tajidu fa inna allaha ghafurur rahim أَأَشْفَقَتُمْ أَنْ تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْ نَجَوَاكُمْ صَدَقَاتٍ فَإِذْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَتَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَأَتِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَاللَّهُ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ تَوَلَّوْا قَوْمًا غَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مَا هُمْ مِنْكُمْ مَا هُمْ مِنْكُمْ وَلَا مِنْهُمْ وَيَحْلِفُونَ عَلَى الْكَذِبِ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ أَعَدَّ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا إنهم ساء ما كانوا يعملون اتخذوا أيمانهم جنة فصدوا عن سبيل الله فلهم عذاب مهين لن تغني عنهم أموالهم ولا أولادهم من الله شيئا أولئك أصحاب النار هم فيها خالدون يوم يبعثهم الله جميعا فيحلفون له كما يحلفون لكم ويحسبون أنهم على شيء ألا إنهم هم الكاذبون استحوذ عليهم الشيطان فأنساهم ذكر الله أولئك حزب الله حزب الشيطان ألا إن حزب الشيطان هم الخاسرون إن الذين يحادون الله ورسوله أولئك إك في الأذلين كتب الله لا أغلبن أنا ورسلي إن الله قوي عزيز. You who believe, when you come to the gathering place of the messenger, then see for then see to it that before you enter into the gathering, you give some charity. That is better for you. And more pure. And if you do not find anything to give as charity, then indeed Allah is forgiving and compassionate. And is it then the case that you have shown mercy and tenderness that you give forward something of what you have of charity in your gatherings? And when you don't do that, then Allah relents upon you. So instead, when you do not have the charity to give, establish the prayer and give the zakah. Obey Allah and his messenger, and Allah is informed of that which you do. Have you not seen a people who Allah's wrath is upon them? And they are not from you, nor from them. They swear on a lie, and they know that they lie. Allah has prepared for them a stern punishment, evil as that which they used to do. They take their oath as a shield, and they hinder from the path of Allah, and they have a punish punishment that's waiting for them. Neither their wealth nor their children can benefit them from Allah in any way whatsoever. They are the companions of the great fire. They are to be therein forever. On the day in which Allah shall resurrect all of them, 
and they will swear to him just as they swore to you. And they think that they are upon something, and they're liars because they are upon nothing. Shaitan has followed them up and caused them to forget the remembrance of Allah. These people are the very party of Shaitan. And is not the party of Shaitan the losers? Those who oppose Allah and his messenger, these are the humiliated and debased ones. Allah has already written, I and my messengers shall most certainly be victorious. Indeed, Allah is mighty and powerful. Surah Mujadid, the 28th Surah, Ayat 12 to 21. And when the exalted one is said, when you come to the gathering of the messenger to seek counsel, there used to be people that would ask the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam questions and for things until it became difficult for him. So Allah sought to lighten the burden from his prophet. So he sent this ayah down as mentioned by Ibn Abbas. Now there were wealthy people that would come to see him. They had a great amount of wealth and they spent a lot of time in the presence of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And sometimes this time that they spent would run into the time that the poor Muslims had in the gathering. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he didn't like this because it did not give an opportunity to the poor. So Allah sent this ayah down. So for those who are wealthy, Allah is saying, before they enter into the gathering, let them give some sadaqah or some type of charity. As for the people in hardship and they don't find anything, there's nothing for them to give. But for those in ease and they are actually stingy, then that is wrong. So Allah sent this down as a dispensation as well for those who did not have it to give. This was mentioned by Muqatil ibn Hayyan. And also Muqatil bin Suleiman. So the poor and destitute at that point, in the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the poor and destitute struggled, and they were not able to give this type of sadaqa going into the gathering. But there was one companion who was able to who did this, and it was Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And Mujahid narrates a hadith from Ali who said, There is one ayah in the Qur'an who no one was able to act by except for me. And no one's been able to act by after me. And this was the ayah of councils. I had one dinar. And I had spent, I had had one dinar and I had spent a lot of the other dinars and when I went to go into the gathering of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I grabbed that and I gave it. After I had given that, another ayah came down that gave a dispensation and lifted this ayah of charity. And so I was the only one who ever did this. Allah says, that is better for you and purer. Meaning, to give sadaqah before entering into the gathering is better for you. It's from obedience to Allah. And pure, because it purifies your sins. And if you don't find that, addressing the poor people, if you poor people don't find anything to give, Allah is forgiving and merciful because he pardons from that which he did not have. And Allah relents towards you. Meaning that you are pardoned from this. And this was later abrogated, this judgment, by the ayah that came after. This was mentioned by Muqatil ibn Hayyan, as well as Qatada ibn Day. Have you not seen a people who turned away and Allah's wrath was upon them? They are not from you nor from them, and they swear by Allah in a lie. This was sent down regarding the hypocrites who turned their attention to the Jews. And they turned over to them secrets of the Muslims. This was mentioned by a Suday and Muqatil. Now the particular person that did this, 
that started this process was Abdullah ibn Nebatal, the hypocrite. He would sit with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the gathering, and then he would go and bring this news back to the Jews. He came to him one day, and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam looked upon him. And Abdullah ibn Nabatal had blue eyes. And he said to him, Have you just come to make an announcement to carry this away to your companions? Abdullah ibn Nabatal felt embarrassed and so he swore by Allah that he didn't do it. And the Messenger and the Prophet said, Indeed you did. He left and went to his companions. And they swore by Allah that they didn't do it. But Allah sent down this ayah to show that they were liars. Al-Hakim narrates in his Sahih collection from the Hadith of Ibn Abbas that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, when he was in the shade of one of his chambers and there were a group of Muslims with him, he said, There shall shortly be coming to you a man who when he looks upon you, he looks with the eyes of shaitan. When he comes to you, don't speak to him. And a man came with blue eyes. And he came to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, you're seeking to take some news from me and back to your companions, are you? The man swore by Allah that he didn't and he left out. And the people that he came to, they later swore by Allah and sought excuses. But Allah sent down the ayah. No, on the day of resurrection, on the day that Allah shall resurrect them all, and they shall swear to him just as they swore to you. The, the commentary of this ayah is those who turn away, meaning the hypocrites, and the, those who have the wrath upon them, وَالْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَالْمَغْضُوبُ عَلَيْهِمْ as well, they are the Jews. Because the ayah runs, have you not seen a people who they turn away and those who Allah's wrath is upon? That's referring to the hypocrites and the Jews. They swear by a lie. We've already discussed this in mentioning the reason for the eyes revelation. And they swear that they did not curse the messenger of Allah وسلم, And they swear that they didn't go to the Jews. And they know that they are lying. And they have taken their oath as a shield. Because they have this shield because they fear that they'll be killed. Ibn Qutayba said this meaning is they've tried to shield themselves by swearing by Allah. But what's happened is their lie has become exposed. And so they swear by Allah although they know that they are lying and it's exposed that they are lying. They hinder from the path of Allah. And there are two statements. They hinder people from the deen of Islam. And they hinder from jihad and fighting in the cause of, of Allah and people using their wealth in this cause. And they swear. They make these oaths. As said by Muqatil and Qatad ibn Da'ima. And they swear. And they will try to swear to Allah in the hereafter that they were believers. Just as they swore to the protectors in this earthly life and they think that they are upon something by giving their fake and false oaths but they are upon nothing and they're liars shaitan has followed them up and he has conquered them and blighted them we've already made this clear in surah nisa the fourth surah 141 he has followed them up and these people shall be humiliated and laid low for in the earthly life they were laid low and in the hereafter they are humiliated. When Allah says about this matter those who oppose Allah and his messenger they will be laid low. Then Allah says I, Allah wrote down and decreed I and my messenger shall be victorious. Meaning the messengers that were sent to carry out warfare in the cause of Allah, they and 
a law, and they shall be victorious. As for the messengers that weren't commanded to commit warfare, then they were victorious and dominant by their evidences. Indeed, a law is mighty and powerful. Close quote. Now, something significant here. There are a couple of things. Number one, this ayah, this this ayah here, ayah 19 of Sutul Mujadila, is used by Imam Ahmed Asawi, who died 1282, Rahimullah. He said, this ayah also aptly describes a group of people who appeared in our time, known as Wahhabis, who came into the Hijaz and corrupted and destroyed things. But the Khilafah came and annihilated them, and may Allah annihilate them from wherever they are in the earth. So he used this ayah as that this refers to all cults as well, because shaitan follows up the cults. Further to this, there are different types of messengers. The first messenger that was sent to carry out jihad for the sake of Allah was Nabi Musa alayhi salam, the scholars say. He was the first one commanded to carry out combat for the sake of Allah. Right? Before that time, messengers did not engage in armed conflict. The messengers spoke with proofs and evidences. But what happened is, when the messengers and prophets started being killed and their lives came under threat, they then returned to the sword. So if you look in the Quran, all the other prophets before Nabi Musa alayhi salam, there's no listing of any combat or anything with them. And so the scholars of commentary make this distinction between the messengers sent to carry out warfare and the messengers not sent to carry out warfare because those messengers were not in harm. Once they started killing prophets and messengers, then armed conflict had to be re- had to be resorted to but in order to defend themselves. Right? So now you had the messengers that came after that went in wars for the sake of Allah. Nabi Musa alayhi salam and all these other messengers, those that didn't did not, but Nabi Musa alayhi salam was the first one. Now, the Imam, rahimullah, he then goes on to say, quote, And Allah the Exalted, he says, لَا تَجِدُ قَوْمًا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ يُوَادُّونَ مَنْ من حاد الله ورسوله ولو كانوا آباءهم أو أبناءهم أو إخوانهم أو إخوانهم أو عشيرتهم أولئك كتب في قلوبهم الإيمان وأيدهم بروح من ويدخلهم جنات تجدي من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه أولئك حزب الله ألا إن حزب الله هم المفلحون You will not find any people who believe in Allah and the last day loving anyone who opposes Allah and his messenger even if they are their fathers or their sons or their brothers or near relatives. Allah has written in the hearts of these people, Iman, and strengthened them with a spirit from him. He shall enter them into gardens under which rivers flow to be forever therein. Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. These ones are the party of Allah 
And shall not the party of Allah be victorious? And are they not the successful ones? Surah Al-Hashr, Surah Al-Mujahidah, the 58th Surah, Ayah, Ayah 22. And so Allah says, you will not find a people. Scholars have said that there are a number of incidents that occurred that brought this ayah about. Number one is Abu Ubaidah, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah. On the day of the battle of Uhud, killed his father in war. Abu Bakr called his son on the battle of Badr to engage in combat. He had said, Messenger of Allah, leave me to go to forward and march. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Maintain your place, Abu Bakr, and march forth with the others. Mus'ab ibn Umayyah had killed his brother, Ubaid ibn Hamna, on the day of Uhud. And Amr had killed his maternal uncle, Al-As ibn Hisham, on the day of Badr. And Ali ibn Abi Talib and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib had, had killed Utba and Shayba on the Battle of Badr, as mentioned by Ibn Mas'ud. So they fought against their own family. This ayah also refers to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Because Abu Quhafa had cursed the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he cursed him in the presence of Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr slapped his father so hard that he fell down. And he mentioned that to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, did you do that? And he said, yes. And he said, don't do that. Abu Bakr responded by saying, had there been a sword nearby, I would have killed him. So Allah sent this ayah down regarding this and other incidents, as said by Ibn Juraj. This ayah also makes reference to another companion, Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Ubay. And that was because he was sitting next to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam drank some water, Abdullah said, Messenger of Allah, let me take some of the goodness of your drink. And he said, what will you do with it? He said, I will use it to wash my father. It may be that with this water, Allah will purify his heart. So he did so. But his father came to him with it and said, what is this? And Abdullah, Ibn Abdullah, said to his father, the head of the hypocrites at the time, it is the leftovers of what the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, drank. I've come to you with it so that you might drink from it. It may be that Allah will purify your heart with this. And he said, you've come to me with this? Well, you might as well come with the urine of your own mother. Abdullah Ibn Abdullah went to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he said, Messenger of Allah, give me permission so I can go back and kill my father. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Don't do that. Be gentle with him and show goodness towards him." And this ayah was sent down in praise of these people. <clears throat> said by a Suday. There was also the incident of Hatib ibn Abi Balta when he wrote a letter to the people of Mecca informing them that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam intended on coming to them. And Muqatil said, said this, and it was also mentioned by Al-Farra and Az-Zajjaj. This ayah makes it clear that loving the unbelievers who show enmity to Islam has an impact on the correctness of one's true iman. Whoever is a believer does not show allegiance to the unbeliever, even if it's his father or his son or anyone from his near relatives. These, meaning those who don't love those who oppose Allah and his messenger, 
Allah has written in their hearts, Iman. So he's established that in their hearts. As said by Rabi'a ibn Anas. He has made that to be the case, as said by Muqatil. He's written that in the preserved tablet because whoever is to believe has been preordained, as said by Al-Mawirdi. He's judged them to have Iman. And this has been mentioned. It's the very place, the wellspring of Iman, which is the hearts, as said by Tha'labi. That's been gathered in their hearts, Iman, until they've perfected it, as said by Al-Wahidi. And he has strengthened them. He's given them power with a spirit from him. Spirit from him means victory, as said by Ibn Abbas and Hassan. It means Iman, as said by as Sudayy. The Quran, as said by Al Rabi'a. Rahma, as said by Muqatil. And the angel Jibreel, alayhi salam, as he strengthened them on the day of Badr, as said by Al Mawirdi. That is the party of Allah, meaning those who enter under the category who have been chosen and set apart and set aside. And Allah emphasized these people to show their rank and their glory. We then look at Surah Al-Hashr. Surah Al-Hashr is a Medinan surah by Ijma. The scholars of commentary say all of it was sent down regarding the Banu and Nadir of the Jews. Ibn Abbas said, this surah, Surah Al-Hashr, is sometimes called Surah Bani Nadir. And it indicates what happened. The scholars, the people of knowledge and commentary and history mentioned that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, went out to Masjid Quba and he had a group of his companions with him and he prayed therein. Then the Banu Nadir came and they spoke to him. And they discussed with him regarding the restitution of two men. And what had happened is they said, what shall we do regarding this restitution? And the matter of the restitution caused some enmity between them. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, gave them the news and informed them of the matter. And the matter was resolved. But some of these children of Israel were filled with enmity. And this was some of the beginnings of the tribulation. The believers glorified Allah when the judgment had been given. But the Jews had been filled, some of them, with enmity. The Banu Nadir, the Banu Qurayza, and others were in Mecca. One of the heads over them was Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf. At one point, he had gone to Mecca to seek the idol worshippers for assistance against the Messenger of Allah wasallam, And Allah had informed his Messenger of that. He had sent Muhammad ibn Maslama to carry out the judicial penalty. And Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf was executed. Then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned them and the date palms that they had used for deriving income for the war were destroyed. And they said, we shall leave from your land then. And leave from Al Medina. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then took them and exiled them to Sham. Some of them he exiled to Khaybar. He took their weapons and their wealth and he found 50 coats of armor and 50 shields and 340 swords. Now some of this we've already mentioned in Surah Al-Hadid, the first ayah. Allah the Exalted he says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Sabbaha lillahi ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard Wa huwa al-azizu al-hakim 
هو الذي أخرج الذين كفروا من أهل الكتاب من ديارهم لأول الحشر ما ظننتم أن يخرجوا وظنوا أنهم ما مانعتهم حصونهم من الله حصونهم من الله فأتاهم الله من حيث لم يحتسبوا وقذف في قلوبهم الرعب يخربون بيوتهم بأيديهم وأيدي المؤمنين فاعتبروا يا أولي الأبصار ولولا أن كتب الله عليهم الجلاء لعذبهم في الدنيا ولهم في الآخرة عذاب النار. In the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. All of what's in the skies and the earth glorifies Allah. He is the Almighty, the All-Wise. He is the one who expelled those who reject faith of the people of the book from their homes for the first ingathering. You did not think that they would leave. And they thought that they would hinder themselves and remain in their castles, safe from Allah. But Allah brought things about in a way in which they did not figure. And he, Allah, threw into their hearts terror and fear. They destroyed their homes with their own hands and the hands of the believers. Now reflect on this, those of you who have insight. Had Allah not decreed for them exile, then he would have punished them all in this earthly life. But they shall have in the hereafter the punishment of the great fire. Surah Al-Hashr, the 59th Surah, Ayat 1 to 3. When the Exalted One says, He is the one who expelled those who reject faith from the people of the book. This is referring to the Jews of the Banu Nadir. He expelled them from their homes, meaning from their habitations. For the first ingathering, there are four important statements that need to be said regarding the ingathering. The first is that they are the first of those for the ingathering and to be expelled from their homes, as said by Ibn Abbas and Ibn Asa'ib. They are the first of ingatherings from the ingathering people from the people of the book. This is the first gathering, their expulsion. The second gathering shall be when they go to the gathering place on the day of resurrection. This is called al hashr al-Thani, as said by Al-Hasan al-Basri, as well as Ikrima. Ikrima also said, whoever doubts that the Jews shall be gathered back to Sham and that the ingathering shall happen in Sham, let him read this ayah. Because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of their being expelled said to them, go out. And they said, where? He said, go to the place of the ingathering of the exiles. This is the first gathering for them. The second gathering is the fire that shall gather them from the east to the west. As said by Qatada. This is the first gathering where they shall be taken out of Al Medina. The second gathering is from Al Khaybar, where they shall also wait, and the rest of Arabia. And then they shall be sent. As the ingathering of the exiles happens, they shall be sent to Jerusalem and its surrounding areas, as well as near the Jordan River from the land of Sham. This happened in the days of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, as said by Murra al-Hamdani. Close quote. So understand this then. The first gathering that Allah refers to is where the gathering, the ingathering of the exiles of the children of Israel starts. He's the one that started the process by prophecy of Allah of sending the children of Israel back to the land of Sham. 
This was the beginning of the in, in gathering of the exiles. Hamas is not going to stop this. The PLO is not going to stop it. The PNLF, the, FN, the FNLF, none of these groups are going to stop this because this is a part of prophecy that must be fulfilled. And I've said this in gatherings, and because people have their Islam by the newspaper clippings, a lot of people opposed me when I said this in Leeds. And there was all types of booing and jeering, which we're fine with. Because revelation takes revelation takes precedence over stand-up comedy and court gestures. The children of Israel are not going to be moved from that land. They're undefeated in all their wars, and that's going to be the same, same case. They came around the Jordan River. They came around Jerusalem and those other areas and took those places over. There is a divine reason why they're supposed to be there. You have to balance between that and the oppression that's happened to the Palestinian people because those two things aren't related. It's not, it's not justified what's happened to the Palestinian people by the children of Israel, but this prophecy is being fulfilled. You have to balance between these two things. So you still get charity and aid and everything else to the Palestinian people. But this idea that people are saying, we're going to push all the Jews into the sea and we're going to do that, you're not going to do anything like that. You're not going to do anything like that. It should be little surprise. If you want to really see a law, a law's plan in action, look at the 1948, 56, 58, 67, and 73 wars. All the nations around you attack you. And there's more Jewish people in New York City than there are in the state of Israel. And they defeat all their neighbors around them. How is that? Especially 1948. This is before Israel was even making its own weapons. How? They didn't have any backing. They defeated all their enemies around them. So, Allah's providence, his plan, the ingathering of exiles starts here. <clears throat> Allah says he's the one that gathered them to the first ingathering of exiles. It starts here. So if someone wants to know, well, wh what does all this mean? You take them straight to this aisle and say the ingathering of exiles and you see the, the state of Israel being born and the children of Israel. This is all a divine prophecy that's come to pass. He's the one that expelled those who reject faith from the people of the book, from their homes for the first ingathering of exiles. You didn't think that they would leave out because the companions, is, they're not going to go anywhere. Because we've already read how many swords they had. They're not going anywhere. And they thought that they were staying in there. They didn't think that this was going to be the beginning of the ingathering of the exiles. The children of Israel knew that at some point they're going to go back to Shem. But they didn't know that this was going to be the time. They didn't know that. This is the ingathering of the exiles. And Allah brought this about in a way in which they did not figure. Who could have thought that Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union would vote in favor of the existence of the state of Israel in 1948. That was the deciding vote. Because it was a stalemate. We're talking about the same Joseph Stalin who did purges every year on Jewish members in the Communist Party. What would make him come out and then vote yes? And then that's it. He goes by, behind the Iron Curtain and that's it. What would make him do that? Right? There's no reason for this. There's all these divine plans working behind the scenes we have to acknowledge this reality it might not go with things politically but who cares about politics we're people of prophecy that's what's important to us and the children of Israel are part of prophecy it's divine prophecy that must occur why is Nabi Isa coming back as Al-Masih Al-Masih to who? to them the Messiah to them, because he's the final the final Israelite prophet to them. He comes back over the whole world and governs, but he's al Messiah to them. Why is there this enmity between Jews and Christians? Because they say he's not the Messiah, the Christian, yes he is. They all say I also say he's deity, but they say he's the Messiah. That's one thing both Christians and Muslims are agreed upon. He's al Messiah. He is the one that's been prophesied. That's what part of this is about. So, 
as Muslims, what we have to do is not get caught up on some of the atrocities that we're seeing on the news and in newspaper clippings. That's wrong. No one's arguing that. What's being done to the Palestinians is wrong. It's oppression. But the children of Israel being in that land, that's part of prophecy. And there's no group or body or militant organization that's going to lift them. You've already seen everything that's happened. Scud missiles and suicide attacks, still there. In fact, they're even dug in more. In fact, they've increased the wall and built in and all the Jewish settlements have been roped in and walled in and all the Palestinian areas have been sealed off. This stuff is all gathering together. What does all this stuff mean? It means that that area is being prepared for something. That that whole area is being prepared for something. It's got walls, fortifications, minefields, booby traps. What, why? Why is all this being prepared? Because that whole area is being prepared for something. And the first ingathering of exiles began at this point. You want a Kafir calendar date? Fine. 623 AD. There's your calendar date for the Kafirs if you have to have it. There's your date. That's the first ingathering of the exiles. That's what's coming. The Imam Rahimullah, he goes on to say, quote, They did not think, you did not think that they would leave. This is being addressed to the believers. You did not think they'd leave from their houses on account of their strength, their power, and their castles. And they thought, meaning the Banu Mudir, they thought that their castles were sufficient to protect them from the power of Allah. But Allah brought about to bear meaning that which he ordered his prophet with fighting against them and exiling them from that which they did not see beforehand. They did not think that that would come to pass. And Allah cast fear in their hearts. Fear from the messenger of Allah وسلم, and fear regarding what had happened to one of their erstwhile leaders, Ka'ab ibn al-Ashraf. They destroyed their homes with their hands in the hands of the believers. And this is what came to pass. So, the commentators mention that they did this to their homes. The Muslims, when they came to a home from the Banu Nadir, they noticed that they had destroyed that place. And during the war, some of the homes had been damaged or destroyed in order to make room for the troops amassing. And some of the children of Israel destroyed their homes so that the Muslims would not have them. This was said by Ibn Abbas. Furthermore, whenever the Muslims had destroyed anything from their castles, they had destroyed whatever was built up from the castles and the fortifications, it said by Abd al-Haq. The children of Israel also took wood inside their homes and the pillars and knocked down some of the pillars in their homes and destroyed them. Some of the children of Israel even broke down the materials of their homes and took it with them. The believers took hold of whatever remained. They destroyed those so that the believers might not live in them out of enmity and hatred for them. It's said by Ibn Zayd. Allah then says, so reflect on this those of you who are people of insight, meaning look at what happened so that you might know, so that you might think on what came to pass. Had Allah, had Allah not decreed for them exile, meaning leaving from their lands, al Mawirdi mentioned that there's a distinction between exile and expulsion. Exile is with the people and the children. And they have left. They've been, they've been exiled. While expulsion 
is although the people and the children might remain behind, a group might have been expelled. But exile is an entire group is exile. Exile doesn't occur except for an entire gathering. But expulsion can happen for one person or a group. So had Allah not decreed for them exile, he would have punished them all in this earthly life by being killed and some of them going into slavery. Just as it happened with the Banu Quraiva. And they have in the hereafter what's waiting for them. What was held back in the earthly life, a terrible penalty. Because they opposed Allah and his messenger. And so this exile, Al-Qadim Ya'ala said, this ayah is proof on the, per- on the permissibility of some of the people in war exiling people from their houses without gathering prisoners or any such thing. It's permitted to do this, to exile the people without jizya, without war slaves, without prisoners of war, or any such thing, without entering into any agreement. It's perfectly permitted that people might be exiled. Now, this particular ruling has been abrogated when there are the when there happen to be among the Muslims a power force to resist against them, because Allah the Exalted commanded to fight the unbelievers until they either become Muslim or they are giving the jizya. So this ruling of exiling them is when the Muslims cannot take complete control over them and they're not able to bring them to Islam by preaching and they're not able to extract the jizya from them, so they are exiled. It's permitted for them to do this. This is also an indication on the permissibility of gathering together whatever leftovers are there from the battle. Because the Messenger of Allah وسلم, made an agreement with the children of Israel from that tribe and in a gathering. And he gave to them whatever leftovers they had of their wealth that, were, that was unknown. Close quote. So what's important here to understand then is that the exile, there's a difference between exile and expulsion. Exile is where jala in Arabic, jala is where the family and everyone, you say, oh, they've been exiled. Right? They've been exiled. Versus expulsion. Expulsion could be an individual or a group of people. If you say, well, what's what's happened to Brother Ahmed? He's been expelled. Ikhraj is expulsion. He's been expelled. Right? So there's this distinction in Arabic between expulsion and exile. English probably doesn't have such a fine distinction. Right? But exile, when you talk about exile, that means a people have been exiled. The children of Israel have not just been kicked out of countries, they've been exiled as well to where they've had to leave altogether as a people from an area, right? The children of Israel were exiled from England. They were exiled from Hungary. They were exiled. They were exiled. They weren't just expelled, but exiled because they couldn't, they couldn't leave family back in many of these instances. In many cases, they were told, no, you've all got to leave. So that's not expulsion. That's complete exile. You've got to leave whatever clothes you have, whatever you can carry, You've got to go. So the Jews that left from Russia to the state of Israel, that that was a brief exile because they were stateless. They had to leave and they had to come to to the state of Israel. Right? But expulsion could be where, where some of them have been expelled but they've got family left behind. That's expulsion. Right? But Allah says, had Allah not decreed for them exile, right, until the first end gathering, so the ingathering of the exiles, besides that, so the children of Israel that aren't living in the state of Israel that we're, that we're calling it, what are they? They're in the U.S. They're here, they're here. What are they? They're in exile. They can't carry out a lot of their religious obligations. They can't do things that they'd be able to do in the state of Israel. They're in exile. And that's exactly how a lot of the rabbis speak. Listen, if you're not living in the state of Israel, you're in exile. 
even those that don't accept the government of the state of Israel or Zionism, no, if you're not living in the land of your fathers, you're in exile. You're in complete exile. So this is what's sort of coming around the corner. Children of Israel are being ingathered, and there's sort of an end of things coming together. There's a finality of things. Just as much as you see, although it's not mentioned, it's sort of happening in a more in, in, in a more systematic and a more gentle way that Arabs are sort of being pushed back to a lot of the original areas that they came to. They're being sort of pushed back. Right, so in places like Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Arabs are being sort of pushed out. There's a lot of enmity and hatred between Arabs and Africans in West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. There's starting to be a lot of hatred between the Banu Muhammad and the Rusheda and these different groups. There's starting to be hatred because they're being pushed back. So it's like these two groups of people are being shifted back. So inshallah, what we'll do is we will stop here and we'll go for a long. When we come back, we'll have a little bit more, inshallah, I say. أقول قبل هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم أستغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم 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 الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وبعد الحمد لله we had left for salah after we completed ayah three of سورة الحشر fifty nine سورة we now return back to the text where the Imam carries on in his commentary saying, quote, And as for the statement of the Exalted One, part of this next statement has already been commented upon in Surah Al-Anfal, the 8th Surah, Ayah 13, and Surah Muhammad, the 7th Surah, Ayah 32. But the Exalted One, he says, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ شَاقُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَمَنْ يُشَاقِ اللَّهَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ شَدِيدُ الْعِقَابِ مَا قَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ لِينَةٍ أَوْ تَرَكْتُمُوهَا قَائِمَةً عَلَىٰ أُصُولِهَا فَبِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ فَبِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَلِيُخْذِيَ الْفَاسِقِينَ وَمَا أَفَاءَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ رَسُولِهِ مِنْهُمْ فَمَا أَوْجَفْتُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ خَيَلٍ وَلَا رِكَابٍ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يُسَلِّطُ رُسُلَهُ يسلط رسله على من يشاء والله على كل شيء قدير ما أفاء الله على رسوله من أهل القرى فلله وللرسول وذي القربى واليتامى والمساكين والمساكين وبن السبيل كي لا يكون دولة بين الأغنياء منكم وما أتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا واتقوا الله إن الله شديد العقاب للفقراء المهاجرين الذين أخرجوا من ديارهم وأموالهم يبتغون فضلا من الله فضلا من الله ورضوانا وينصرون الله ورسوله أولئك هم الصادقون 
والذين تبوأوا الدار والإيمان من قبلهم يحبون من هاجر إليهم ولا يجدون في صدورهم في صدورهم حاجة مما أوتوا ويؤثرون على أنفسهم ولو كان بهم خصاصة ومن يوقى شح نفسه فأولئك هم المفلحون That is because they opposed Allah and His Messenger. And whoever opposes Allah, then indeed Allah is stern in punishment. And whatever was cut down of the date palms or whatever you left standing on its roots, then it was by the permission of Allah and so that the rebellious sinners might be laid low. And whatever of the fay that Allah left behind for the Messenger from among them, and whatever was given away, whether it happened to be steeds of war, or other trinkets and such, then but Allah the Exalted has given authority of his messengers over whoever he wills. And Allah has power over everything. And whatever fate Allah had given to his messenger, and whatever authority from the people of the areas, then to Allah and his messenger, and to the near relatives, the orphans, the needy, the travelers, is a portion so that there is no difficulty from them as they are among the wealthy from among you who have their means. Whatever the messenger should give you, then you take it. And whatever he has forbidden you from, then abstain. And fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is stern in punishment. For the destitute among the immigrants, those who were expelled from their home and taken, had their wealth taken from them, seeking Allah's pleasure and his favor, and they helped Allah and his messenger. These very people are the truthful ones. Those who opened their homes and had faith from before them. And loved those who made the immigration to them. And they didn't find any hardship in their hearts. And they preferred those who came to them over themselves. Even though they had difficulties. And whoever is able to preserve himself from stinginess then these ones are the successful. Surah Al-Hashr, the 59th Surah, Ayat 4 to 9. When the Exalted One is said, whatever was cut down of the date palms, this was revealed because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had burned some of the date palms of the Banu Madir and cut others. And this ayah was sent down regarding it. And this hadith was also taken from Al-Bukhari and Muslim, from Ibn Umar. The scholars of commentary mentioned that it was sent down regarding the Banu Madir, who had held up in their castles and fortifications. And he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was ordered to cut the date palms and to burn others and to leave others in their place. And they said, Messenger of Allah, look at, the, look at what they are saying. The children of Israel said, Muhammad, you claim that you want a armistice with us is it then an armistice or some type of trade that you have destroyed the trees and cut the date palms has this have you been sent down to have corruption in the earth what is going on and so the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam waited and he and the muslims and themselves watched as well waiting for what the reply would be and so some of them said well don't cut anything more until we've been told. While others said, No, we will cut them down until we're told not to. And so this ayah was sent down regarding the testification that the trees have been forbidden, forbidden from being cut down. But allowing the trees to be cut down if they were grown in sin and wrongfulness because they had to be destroyed. Some have been cut and others had been left in their place by the permission of Allah. Close quote. Now what this is talking about is when we went through the seerah of Ibn Hisham as well, those that have gone through the seerah, um, he had known which ones had been grown with riba and which ones had not. 
And so the Prophet wasallam, whatever had been grown for riba was cut down and burned. Which makes you understand the severity of what riba is, how, how severe it is. It's so severe that it's the last prohibition in the Quran. It's so severe that when some of the people of Ta'if who prayed, fasted, made hajj, they still insisted on trading in riba. The Prophet wasallam, went down there and for 15 days he shelled that area. And people had large shell, the catapults were used against them. And he fought these people that prayed and fasted and made hajj. He fought them and he killed some of them. Because of, because of what riba represents, how destructive riba is. That it was so important that a war had to be carried out to stop it. The imam goes on to say, quote, As for the expression used for the date palms, lina. There are six things that this refers to. Lina can often be used to refer to all date palm trees other than the one that gives the ajwa dates. This was said by Ibn Abbas, Ikrimah, Qatada, and Al-Farra. Lina can also be used to refer to trees in general, not just date palms. The color of the date palm is also discussed, as said by Ibn Abbas, al barniya uh, Az-Zuhri, Abu Ubaidah, and Ibn Qutaybah. As the judge have also, uh, as the judge has also said, the people of Medina named all the date palms according to their colors, other than the Burni and the Ajwa tree. So this refers to its color. This was mentioned also by Mujahid and Atiyah ibn Zaid ibn Jarir and others. This expression lina also refers to the fruit of the date palm as said by Sufyan ibn Uyayna. Because these type of trees, the fruit that they gave was a very strong yellowish color. And its fruit was most pleasing indeed to the onlooker as said by Muqatil. Now, how many trees were cut by the Muslims in this campaign, it has been said that they that there were there were cut as well as burned six date palm trees, as said by Abdul Haq. However, others have said one large date palm was cut, and one large date palm was burned, as said by Ibn Ishaq. However, others have said it was four date palms that were cut. And the same number burned partially, as said by Muqatil. This was by the permission of Allah, by his command, so that the rebellious sinners, meaning the Jews, might be humiliated for what they had done, because they had used riba and used their wealth to try to hurt the believers in this regard. Then when Allah says, And whatever authority Allah had given to his messenger over them, meaning over the Banu Nadiya, and whatever had been taken of the steeds of war, and whatever other trinkets that they had had, whether they be camels or the like. And this could include horses, camels, or other type of riding or pack mounts. So there's nothing for you in that regard to be angry about because this is what occurred, and that whatever was taken, as known as the Fay. This is for the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to distribute a zakah. The scholars of commentary mentioned that some of the Muslims sought from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to divide the wealth up of the Banu Nadir into five portions after they were exiled. And this ayah was sent down to make it clear that Fay is not divided into fifths. Fay is divided according to what the Messenger وسلم, has decreed and he gives it out according to its portion. So, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he divided up the Fay among the immigrants. And the Ansar were not given any, except for three among them who had a definite need, such as Abu Dujana, Sahal ibn Hunayf, and Al Harith ibn al Harith ibn al Simma. Then he mentioned the ruling of Al Fay, and he quoted this ayah that whatever Fay that Allah has given his Messenger from the people of the rounding areas meaning the wealth of the unbelievers of the surrounding area. Then the fay belongs to Allah, so he commands with it whatever he decides. 
and to his messenger to give it to whoever he may will. And also to the near relatives, the, the, the near relatives, as well as the orphans, which was mentioned in Surah Anfal, the 8th Surah 41. We've mentioned already in that place the distinction between fay and ghanima or war treasure. So someone may refer back to that. Now the scholars have differed regarding the judgment in this ayah. Some have said that the, that the intent of fay here, because sometimes fay can in general refer to all war treasure, which was taken by the Muslims from the wealth of the unbelievers at Anwa, and that which was given. And Allah has named those who were victorious in that regard that they might use this as fay. However, this was abrogated by Surah Al-Anfal, Ayah 41. وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ مَا غَنِمْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Know that you have only been authorized to take the war treasure of something according to its decree. This is the statement of Qatada, Yazid ibn Ruman, and another group have mentioned that this fay is what was taken from the wealth of the idol worshippers that wasn't used in war in terms of steeds and chariots of war or other trinkets. And there was neither a treaty because fay comes about when there's neither a treaty or jizya given after a battle. And it's divided sometimes into tenths. The same thing can be said of wealth of the one who died and daughter of Islam from among them and had no inheritor. That this wealth is separated up into tenths or smaller. And this is what happened in the time of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, where they were separated into fifths and then tenths. A fourth was given to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to do with it whatever he so willed. A fifth to the remaining who were mentioned in this ayah and everything else. Now the scholars differ in what is done with the rest of it. Because after the death of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, does fay continue? Because fay was something specific to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, according to what we saw in Surah Al-Anfal, the 8th Surah 41. So is does it remain or has it been abrogated according to what we understood fay remains for the governors or the rulers or the scholars who may decide what shall so happen in that event and the evidence regarding it being abrogated is not contextual and this is so that the fay might not be a difficulty for those believers after those who are wealthy had a means and had a way so those who are most destitute, who have fought, have the most right to be given of the fate that's been taken so that they might tether and water their horses and look after their families with that. And whatever the messenger gives you of the fate, then take hold of it. But whatever he forbade you from taking hold of it, then abstain. And this was discussed regarding the matter of fate. But this is also general in all of what he's commanded with and all of what he's taken with. So he makes a distinction, as, a, as the judge has said, between the one who is needy, who he has a right, for example, when Allah said, and the immigrants who are needy and destitute have their right. They're seeking favor from Allah and his messenger and seeking his pleasure by going out and making hijrah. They are the truthful ones because they have iman. And then Allah praised the Ansar in the next ayah by saying that when the Ansar opened their homes to those coming from Dar al Hijrah and coming to Al Medina, that they had Iman before them, meaning that they had the Iman and they opened their homes to them before the Muhajireen came. They were already ready to give their homes up. And that they had no selfishness in themselves and they preferred the Muhajireen over themselves. So although the Muhajireen, the immigrants had become Muslim before the Ansar, the helpers, they had nowhere to stay. And the helpers opened their homes in Al-Medina. They opened it to them before they'd even left out of Al-Mecca, before they even left out of Mecca. So they opened themselves up and they loved all of those who came to them because they shared their wealth and they shared their homes and they found no envy nor hatred in themselves. So whatever they had, they gave.
and so their wealth and their homes even though they had need and they were some of them were in difficulty they gave what they had and so a man came to the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he had difficulty and he said messenger of allah i am so hungry please feed me so the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent word to his wives do you have anything to give all of them said by the one who sent you with the truth we don't have anything in the house except for water so he said there's nothing in the sight of the messenger of allah that he can feed you with this night then he said is there anyone who can give this man something and allah will show mercy upon him this night a man stood up and he said i will messenger of allah so he took him to his house and he said to his family this is the guest of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so honor him and don't refuse him anything his wife said we don't have anything except the food that we might give to the small children he said stand and put the children to bed boil some water and let the smoke rise until they sleep and thinking and think they will be awoken for food but don't give them anything then light the kiln and when the guest has taken what he needed and taken his fill then whatever is left we will eat from that ourselves and the children and this was done and the guest took his fill of what he needed because this is the guest of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so he ate until he was full and she did as her husband commanded her and the guest thought that they were eating along with him later on so he took his fill and thought nothing of it and left nothing behind other than a few morsels when they awoke in the morning then they made their way to the messenger of allah and when he looked to them he smiled and he said allah was most pleased in the night with you and he was pleased with your actions and he sent down and they preferred them over themselves even though they were in need this hadith was from al-bukhari and muslim similarly it was narrated from abu hurairah this hadith is known as the guest of the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this man was given as a gift to them and they preferred him the helpers preferred him over themselves and whoever guards himself from avarice and stinginess then they are successful indeed so such a one does not take anything from that which allah has forbidden him from and he doesn't forbid anything that allah has commanded him to discharge so the helpers they didn't have stinginess in themselves they preferred the helpers over themselves close close اقول قبل هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم استغفر الله ان الله غفور رحيم ارحم الراحمين so inshallah today we covered from surah al-mujadila 58th surah all the way up to ayah 9 of surah al-hashr okay are there any questions over what we've covered today yes The har is where a man says to his wife, "You are to me as my mother's back." And in uh, the context of the law, is that what no. Happens? What what happens is he's he's declared himself free of his wife regarding sexual intercourse. When that happens, there are now he now has to make a decision: is he going to take her back as she is, or is he going to divorce her? He has to make a decision. But bef- but before he takes her back and enjoys company with her sexually he has to give an expiation and one of the things that's important about this it shows how important a law considers the institution of marriage 
that just for saying something like that, just for saying, oh, you're to me like my mother's back, Allah makes you have to do an expiation. Because the institution of marriage is so important to not make a joke of it, to not bring jahiliya into it, and to not consider it and to not consider it something to joke about or to laugh about or to even try to mock the wife about. You were to me like my mother's back because he became angry with his wife for whatever reason. And then what happens is in the jahiliya, it could mean talaq or it could not. So when he was a Muslim, he's always become Muslim. But he still says things from the past. So when he said this, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he sat and he waited and he said, has your husband then made, been for, made forbidden from you? And she said, I don't know why he's done this. He's oppressed me. So he waited until Allah had sent down revelation. He sent down revelation to say the people that have done this, that return from what they say, meaning they, didn't, they weren't seeking talaq. They were saying it out of anger. Well, then you have to either free a slave or fast two months concurrently, or feed 60 poor people. The only thing near that in magnitude is breaking the fast of Ramadan in the daytime through sexual intercourse with your wife. That's the only thing close to magnitude and expiation for that. What's that telling you? What's that telling you about that Allah has put on the same level as having sexual intercourse during Ramadan in the day with your wife as saying this to your wife? It's telling you that the institution of marriage and the institution of fasting, these things, they have high ranks in the sight of Allah. Whenever Allah commands an expiation for anything, it's because something's been violated. And when one of Allah's rights has been violated, then that right has to be resolved. And the only way it can be resolved, the only way that Allah can be made pleased, is through that thing being done. Yes? Any other questions? Yes. Um, uh, one of the things um, that we know is that um, one of the worst people in the Ummah are the one that killed a prophet or the one that is killed by a prophet. This is usually... <coughs> so can this be used in terms of the people of Taif uh, who were shelled and then subsequently some of them were killed by a prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so the question is can the hadith of the worst from among the worst of people are those who were killed by a prophet or those who killed the prophet can this be used as a discussion regarding people of Taif who were killed by the prophet um, that hadith is actually a reference to unbelievers so we wouldn't use it for the people of Taif they were believers but it shows that there's a penalty there because the prophet sallallahu killed these people as a judicial punishment not as apostates but as a judicial punishment because after they were forbidden they still did it anyway so that was a judicial punishment alright is there any final question? yes uh, what did you mean when you said um, restitution? restitution is whenever you commit an infraction against someone in the revealed law for example you, you get in a fight with someone and you didn't mean to kill someone, but in the course of the fight, you hit them, he hits the ground, his head slaps the pavement, and he dies. Now, the family can forgive you from that, or the family can ask for restitution. And the restitution will be whatever he used to bring in every year or every month for a duration of time. Because that has to be satisfied. So if they say, we're not seeking any remonstrance against you, we know that this was a mistake, but we seek restitution from you because you took our father, you took the main wage earner, you took the breadwinner from our household, and you deserve to taste from what you did for that, right? So when someone pays restitution, restitution could be something like that. If you knock someone's teeth out in a scuffle, you might have to pay for the tooth to get refitted. If you injured someone or split someone's head open, you might have to pay the restitution for their medical bills. Restitution covers any of these type of things. All right. Okay. So we'll close from here. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Wa ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Innahu ghafurur rahim. Wa la ilaha illa Allah. Wassalamu alaykum.